welcome to the next episode in the dog genetics lessons. Today, we are going to be talking about white spotting, ticking, and roaning. But before we start, I highly recommend you watch the previous episodes if you're new to the series. It's important to learn about black, agouti, liver, dilution, red, and more before going on. But let us begin by starting off with the S locus. Most white markings on a dog is determined by the S locus. Another name for it is white spotting. White spotting can occur on any color and will cover up both eumelanin and pheomelanin. Dogs can have white markings whether they're black, blue, liver, Isabella, brindle, sable, tan pointed, merle, and more. White fur happens when skin cells are unable to produce any pigment. The gene impairs the cells on the skin to make pigment, so the skin becomes pink and the fur white. Nails and paw pads will also become pink in areas where pigment is not produced. And so far, only two alleles have been proven to exist in the S locus. Big S, which is no white, and little s, which is piebald. No white is dominant to white. A third allele may exist for the extreme white, but it hasn't been proven, and all dogs have been shown to be almost like his little s instead. The white spotting genes are thought to be examples of incomplete dominance. This means that a heterozygous dog will express its most dominant gene, but may be affected by a more recessive one to a lesser extent. It has been shown that some dogs with white spotting do not have the S gene at all. This is mostly dogs with Irish spotting. The allele that causes this pattern has not yet been determined and is not known if it's located in the S locus. So for this lesson, we'll just refer to this gene as little si, but it may most likely be located in a different locus to s. Little si is much less common than little s, and only occurs in certain breeds. Whichever white a dog has, its white will always follow the same rules as spread. White starts on the farthest edges of the dog, like the tail tip and the tip of the muzzle, the paws and the tip of the breastbone. This is known as a trim pattern. From there, it spreads to cover the muzzle and forehead, the front of the chest, the lower legs, and more of the tail, creating Irish spotting. Next, it spreads from the front of the back of the neck and up the legs and tail. On a piebald dog, only the head, back, and tail base may still be colored. The back coloring is the next to go, followed by the tail base, and then the face markings. The ears will always remain colored unless the dog has a very high amount of white. The ears are generally the last part of the dog to turn white. Now the white rules aren't set in stone, as sometimes some dogs have unusual white patterns, like uneven white on the legs or patches in un unexpected places. If you have seen my cat genetics video, white spotting can be separated into 10 grades of coverage. But unlike cats, dogs can be specified into four grades of coverage that vary. And the first one we will talk about are the residual white and white trim. Sometimes a very small amount of white on the chest, toes, or tail may happen when the pigment doesn't migrate fully as the embryo develops. But this is called residual white, and it can sometimes be caused by minor illness in the mother of the puppy. Their genotype would be homozygous big S. There is no particular genetic basis for residual white, but it is possible that some dogs can pass it to on to their offspring. But if a slightly larger amount of white is present, then the dog might be heterozygous. It's hard to tell if a marking is residual white or white trim and can only be proven with genetic testing. Next we have the Irish spotting, which can also be known as the Boston or Mantle in breeds that do not show true Irish spotting. The white markings of an Irish spotting are white legs, the tip of the tail, the chest, the neck, and the muzzle. Many dogs also have a full white neck ring and a blaze on their foreheads. True Irish spotting is caused by the unidentified gene. But we can assume Irish spotted dogs are homozygous little SI. This means that two Irish spotted dogs that breed together will produce puppies with true Irish spotting. If a solid dog bred with an Irish spotted dog, they will produce a heterozygous dog with less white, like a white trim. Breeds who have true Irish spotting are the Australian Shepherd, the Border Collie, and the Bernese Mountain Dog. None of these breeds come regularly in peel bald or extreme white. Pseudo-Irish is a term for piebald spotting that looks the same or very similar to true Irish spotting, but is caused by heterozygous S and not homozygous little SI. In fact, a pseudo-Irish could even be homozygous piebald. 
When a breed of dog is not an Aussie, Border Collie, or Bernese Mountain Dog, then any other breed that shows an Irish spotting is actually pseudo-Irish. There have been cases of white spotted dogs that are whiter than usual, called a flashy Irish spotting, which might be caused by a combination of little si and little s. This type of pattern supports the theory that little si might actually be on a different locus, as the alleles appear to be inherited completely separately. This gene of white spotting can occur in Shelties. Next we have Piebald pattern, which usually produces a colored head, where white on the muzzle and forehead may or may not be present, and patches on the body. The base of the tail is usually colored, but patches can be located anywhere on the body, but rarely on the legs. Piebald is a recessive trait and can remain hidden. Lastly, there's the extreme white pattern. The extreme white consists of a completely white dog with small amounts of color on its head, and sometimes the base of its tail. Small patches in the body may be present too. The nose can be pink or partly pink, and the eyes may be blue in some breeds. As of when the, this video gets released, all extreme white dogs that have been through genetic testing have been shown to be homozygous for Piebald, or little s. Extreme white can cause problems like deafness due to lack of pigment in the ear preventing proper function, and they're more prone to skin cancer. One unusual white spotting pattern that seems to happen are called split faces and whiteheads. It is thought to be a separate gene or modifier that causes some dogs with Irish spotting, piebald, or trim to have a split or completely white face, even when there's very little white on the rest of the dog. A split face is when half the face is white and the other half is colored. Split and white heads are common in bull type dogs. Any white area on the dog, no matter how big or small, may be ticked or roamed due to the T locus, which we'll learn about later in this session. White boxers have become somewhat of a mystery to geneticists. Boxers can come in what appears to be Irish spotting, so we expect the genes in the boxer to be homozygous to little si. But sometimes boxer puppies are born completely white or almost all white. How these puppies could be regularly born to parents with little white spotting has perplexed boxer breeders for a long time. And now it's thought that not all boxers have the little SI gene and some seemingly Irish spotted boxers are actually pseudo-Irish and some are flashy Irish. When two pseudo-Irish or flashy Irish boxers are bred together, some of the puppies may be homozygous peeable, the right genotype for extremely white boxers. There is also a pattern in the German Shepherd breed that has been fascinating. German Shepherds could have a white spotting gene called Panda, but it is completely different white mutation to normal dogs. Though it may look like Irish spotting, the pattern is actually caused by a different gene known as KIT. Panda is a dominant mutation and can be embryotic lethal. Similar to Harlequin, when an embryo has two copies of the Panda gene, it will be reabsorbed into the womb. Some panda shepherds have blue eyes and split faces. Sometimes white can occur on dogs separately to the S locus. One example is part of the double merle pattern. Double merles can appear as piebald or extreme white, but in reality, they actually don't carry big S little s or little s little s. Harlequin also has a similar effect. White can also occur due to the dilution of pheomelanin in the eye locus. This is when red pigment is diluted to cream, ivory, or sometimes white. The main way you can tell the difference between a dog with extreme white spotting, apart from a dog with female linen dilution, is to look at the pigment of the nose, lips, and eye rims. A dog with extreme white spotting is likely to be missing some pigment in these areas, being partly or all pink. A dog with female linen dilution will still have solid black in those areas. This Siberian Husky and this Finnish Lapland are genetically black and tan, but the dilution in their tan points turns it to white. It can be very easy to mistake diluted points for white markings, but the points will generally be very regular to tan points and symmetrical. But these dogs can also have white spotting on top of their red dilution. Urajiro is another red dilution pattern that can look like white markings. Urajiro creates traditional white marks on a red dog, like the Shiba Inu and white spotting can mix with the Irajiro, like with this Pembroke Welsh Corgi. If you look closely, you can see the cheeks are more an off-white color, not bright like the neck. Now we will move into ticking and roan on the T-locus. So what exactly is ticking and roan? 
Well, ticking is flecks or spots of color on white areas. It can occur on any white area on the dog as long as the white is real white and not red dilution. Dogs can have a ticking allele, but not show it due to not having any white on them. There are three alleles in the T locus. Big T, which is ticking, Big TR, which is roan, and little t, which is clear white. It is unclear if ticking or roan is more dominant than the other, but both genes are dominant to clear white. Ticking amount and density can vary greatly in dogs, and this could be explained in incomplete dominance. A homozygous big T dog would have heavy ticking, and a heterozygous T dog would have lighter ticking. It is not clear if this works for roan and dalmatian spots. The color of ticking and roan depends on the color that the area would have been if there wasn't any white. So if a black and tan dog with white markings has ticking, it would display black ticking on its body and tan ticking on its legs, chest, and muzzle. Roan is a pattern that produces heavily mottled white areas. It's often seen in small amounts of white. Black dogs with roaning often appear a grayish color, which can be called blue roan. It's similar to why blue merles are called blue when they're genetically black. Ticking can be confused with Harlequin, which is genetically Merle, and dogs with ticking and or roan are genetically born white. Dalmatian spots had puzzled geneticists for a long time. They are a unique breed and do not occur anywhere else in the world, but recently it is now known that Dalmatian spots are actually a form of ticking, affected by another gene that acts as a modifier. Dalmatian spots are bigger than standard ticking, more sparse, and more evenly distributed. Dalmatian spots are whatever color the dog would be if it didn't have white. Dalmatians usually come with black or liver spots, but red, brindle, and blue can occur, though very rarely. Dalmatians are born white and develop their spots later on, just like other dogs with ticking and roam. They do sometimes have solid patches on their heads or bodies, which is the result of a genetically extreme white piebald. High white piebald is sometimes associated with deafness, and unfortunately this is a common thing with Dalmatians especially when the Dalmatian doesn't have a solid ears or face patches. So when is ticking not actually ticking? This is when patterns can confuse or look very similar to a ticking pattern when genetically there is no ticking. The answer is when it's on the base of a merle. The diluted areas of the merle can look ticked, but is not caused by a ticking gene and is just part of the merle pattern. And that's it for this look guy, which means we're almost done the series. There are two episodes left. One where I go more into detail on oddities, nose colors, eye colors, and coat types, and one episode dedicated to deciphering to what your own dog would look like. Yes, your own dog could be featured in this special episode of Dog Color Genetics. If you want your dog to be featured in an episode, take a picture of your dog and send it on my Google Plus page, which is of course Alyssa Joanne 4. Try to get the best quality of pictures and from different angles. The more the better. But I'll even use some old dogs of mine as well. Hope to get lots of pictures, and I'll see you in the next episode.